Hello and welcome to KAUS Live. The 24th Conference of Parties, or COP24, is set to kick off in Katowice, Poland. And the conference will include presentations by a number of KAUS researchers, including Manny Sarathi of the Clean Combustion Research Center and Hussein Hatayt of the Ali Al Naimi Petroleum Research Center. So we've invited them into the studio to talk about their work and why they're optimistic about the next generation of technologies being developed to tackle climate change. So guys, thank you for, for joining us both. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, so um, people might be a tiny bit skeptical. You guys both work in some facet of the oil and gas industry. Why are you going to COP24 and what is it that you're going to be talking about? Maybe Hussein, you can get us started off. Yeah, sure. Um, so as you mentioned, actually, my background actually is petroleum engineering. Mm -hmm. And that's a good question, you know, mm -hmm. like the guys who are creating basically all this problem, <laughs> maybe, you know, are going there and can be part of the solution. Right. Um, well, the, the, the answer is yes, actually, we can be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And the, the area actually that we're, my interest is, is related to enhance our recovery. And what we're trying to focus on, how can you basically uh, uh, reuse CO2 mm -hmm. and uh, as a win-win technology, you know, instead of emitting CO2 to the atmosphere, can we actually reduce these emissions, you know, and bring back the CO2 back to the reservoir? Mm -hmm. So this is the area where actually, this is where our ex expertise actually is in. We, we've done this as industry for I more see. than three, four decades. And this is where actually we can capitalize on this experience, you know, to, to, to try to solve this, this uh, global problem. So, so using that uh, CO2 collected in such a way and then using it to get at tougher, to, to reach uh, pockets of oil, essentially? Yes, exactly. So this <coughs> is the, uh, the, the purpose here is in from one side, actually, it's going to mm -hmm. be good to the environment, you know, by reducing the emissions. From the other side, we're going to use it actually to uh, enhance the extraction of CO2, mm -hmm. of, of oil from the reservoir. You know, CO2, it is actually a good solvent. When you inject it to the reservoir, it is at high pressure, high temperature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is liquid-like solution. So it, is, uh, it can actually displace the oil and improve the oil uh, extraction. Mm -hmm. So in, in this aspect, it is what we call win-win technology, you know, beneficial for the environment and beneficial actually for the energy in terms mm. of optimizing uh, oil extraction. Right. And, and, and so you'll be presenting about that. Manny, what are you going to be talking about? Yeah, so I work in the Clean Combustion Research Center. Yeah. And, uh, okay, it's quite clear that uh, the large fraction of uh, carbon dioxide emitted to the atmosphere yeah. is from combustion-generated power sources, so automobiles, uh, aircrafts, yeah. marine vessels, these are all transportation applications which burn hydrocarbons and the product of that combustion is, is CO2. Uh, furthermore, we burn a lot of hydrocarbons for uh, heat generation in industry, that emits about a lot of CO2, and also home heating applications yeah. in many, many northern climates are, and residential heating applications are emitting CO2 due to combustion. Yeah. So pro the largest contributor to uh, global CO2 is combustion generated sources. And therefore our role as a center is to ensure that uh, the CO2 is decreased from combustion generated uh, sources. Mm -hmm. How can you do that? One option is uh, you move to other sources of energy, renewable energy, solar, wind, Hydro, but and, that's uh, going to take a long time. And those are, there's yeah. experts at KAUST yeah. working in those areas to <coughs> develop those technologies. But given the demand growth for energy, mm. the growth in uh, economies around the world, primarily in Asia and Africa, mm. there's a significant projection of the use of combustion generated power, at least for the next uh, 30 to 40 years. Right. And I like to use a quote from uh, Professor Patsik, who's the director of the the Petroleum Research Center, that hydrocarbons will have to underwrite the transition to more sustainable forms of energy. Mm -hmm. So hydrocarbons should be seen as a s underwriting some transition for other types of uh, technologies to become developed mm -hmm. and mature in the next uh, 40 to 50 years. Mm -hmm. But given the uh, potential impact of climate change, uh, the potential impacts of CO2 on the atmosphere, we cannot wait for those uh, technologies to become mature. So we need to ensure that the combustion generated power sources mm. reduce CO2 in the next 20 to th uh, 40 years yeah. so that the impact on the environment, say 50, 60 years from now is mitigated. 
And, so, and the primary way of doing that is twofold. One is uh, efficiency improvement. We work heavily on that, efficiency improvement. And second is generating new technologies of combustion which make it easy to capture mm -hmm. and store and sequester CO2. So, so give us some examples of those that are, that are happening at uh, the CCRC. So if it, so, and this is the same thing a major oil company would look at as well. Their mm -hmm. main strategies for CO2 management are efficiency <coughs> improvement, mm -hmm. and then also developing technologies uh, to capture and sequester the CO2 not emitted to the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So on efficiency improvement, uh, we work in, in uh, several areas. Combustion is again used for automobiles and for transportation. So we're working on very high efficiency engines uh, for for truck applications, for long-range uh, automotive transport mm. of goods. We have uh, Professor Bengt Johansson in our center who leads an initiative with Volvo trucks to develop the most efficient engine ever known. It's a conventional internal combustion engine operating on diesel or gasoline fuel operates at about 30 to 50 percent of thermal efficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, some new technologies that we have actually been developing and Aramco is championing a lot is called the gasoline compression ignition engine, mm -hmm. which reaches maybe 55 percent thermal efficiency. And then as a university, uh, what Professor Bengt Johansson works together with Volvo and, and potentially other companies as well, is trying to make an engine that breaks the 65, 60, 65 percent thermal efficiency mark. Mm. And uh, so this kind of concept for very high efficiency engines mm. for, gener for automotive applications is, is in the works, uh, trying to break the 60% barrier. And if, we, again, if we, we get more efficient at producing work from burning hydrocarbon resources, then the amount of CO2 goes down. It's a direct correlation. Is that, sim so is that basically taking the idea of a diesel engine that has high pressure and, and transferring it to a, to a petrol engine? I mean, is that essentially what that's, you're talking uh, about? That's one way. Mm -hmm. That's, that's <clears throat> the so-called gasoline compression ignition engine, mm -hmm. which gets us to 50, 55 percent efficiency. But uh, that will not take us to the 60 percent uh, mark. So breaking 60 percent requires uh, re rethinking the entire thermodynamic cycle. So a, a, a concept that he's pioneered is called the eight-stroke engine. Ah. So rather than your typical four-stroke engine, mm -hmm. this engine has eight strokes. It's a double compression to get you up to 300 bar peak pressure during combustion, very high pressure engine. Mm -hmm. uh, higher pressure you go, the more efficient your engine is, and then a double expansion. So it, it's, a new, it's a new cycle, uh, relatively young in its uh, maturity, still at the research stages, but mm -hmm. industry sees an interest in developing this technology because if they can have these types of 60% plus efficient engine, it, it can a really good way of controlling CO2 emissions. Yeah. And, uh, and the so gas turbines, similarly, we work with, uh, with companies like uh, General Electric trying to develop more high efficiency gas turbines if you go in a gas turbine, if you go to lean, pre-mixed combustion, you can get higher efficiency. If you increase the pressure in the combustor, mm -hmm. you can go to higher efficiency. So this is moving to grid, tied, large yeah, scale. more stationary power <coughs> generation mm -hmm. uh, type applications. So reciprocating internal combustion engines are used for automobiles, yeah. trucks, transportation like marine vessels. But stationary applications tend to work more on gas turbine technology for large-scale power production. So we're trying to make those types of uh, systems more efficient as well. Right. So from the efficiency side, it's all about understanding the fundamental aspects of combustion, the thermodynamic power cycle, where can you make improvements, where can you go to higher pressures. Higher yeah. pressure gets you more efficiency, but then it introduces a lot of challenges in terms of the types of uh, materials you can use, how you keep the combustion stable and operating. And these are the major challenges uh, we're trying to work on uh, on the efficiency side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, it, of course, it still has the drawback that it's creating uh, CO2. Yes. So uh, I'd, <coughs> I'd ask Hussein, how do you grab CO2, mm -hmm. and then how do you sequester it? Uh, talk, so, talk about that. Absolutely. No, just, <coughs> just I'll build up on one, uh, yeah. what Manny is actually talking about, which is efficiency. And this is where actually we, we, we try to, uh, you know, uh, focus on the efficiency and improving our efficiency uh, within actually the whole life cycle, mm. you know, from the oil production all the way to combustion, you know, combustion engine or actually for uh, energy utilization and so on. 
So the efficiency we're talking about here is that we are focusing on is related to how you basically optimize CO2, uh, uh, CO2 to extract the maximum amount of oil mm -hmm. by using the less amount of CO2. Because here, for, for us, at the end of the day, there is a cost associated for CO2 capture. Okay, there, there is, uh, you know, in terms of uh, building facilities, infrastructure, to the energy actually that you need to use actually to, to extract or uh, separate CO2, mm -hmm. and then to the pipelines and transportation. So at the end, you know, if you, uh, if you, uh, the, 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 the basically the operator, the oil operator the, uh, at the oil field, they need to somehow purchase CO2, mm -hmm. either coming from uh, some stationary sources, power plants, desalination, and so on, ah. is coming at some cost, okay? And now you need, this is uh, you, uh, to operate at, uh, you know, uh, economic conditions, you have to, you know, optimize the usage of the CO2. Mm -hmm. So this is what we work on, you know, how you optimize, you know, minimize the usage of CO2 to maximize the, uh, the oil production. Mm -hmm. Does this require a carbon market, as, as people often talk about? Yes, so uh, carbon market, so right now, actually, there is a cost gap mm -hmm. between the capture uh, process and actually the, uh, what the, f uh, the, the field can uh, afford, you know, to operate at economic conditions. Mm -hmm. And this, this uh, gap, actually, it varies depending on the oil price, the market oil price, the higher the oil price, the, uh, the, uh, the barrel, uh, oil uh, barrel, the, the smaller the gap is, okay? And, the, uh, and this is, is very also sensitive to the other, um, you know, components or factors like, for example, the policy, for example, is there actually mm -hmm. tax, uh, tax policy and so on. Right. So right now we have, uh, you know, CO2 capture uh, also varies depending where the, what the industry or the sector coming from. So, the, uh, for example, the cheapest now could be maybe related to the uh, gas processing units or uh, some, some petrochemical uh, processing units where actually CO2 comes out at very high concentration. Mm. So what you need is just, uh, you know, relatively speaking, a simple process to compress CO2 dehydrated and transport it in the pi pipeline. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, we don't have enough supply from this, if you like, affordable CO2 to mm -hmm. be actually used at in, uh, for oil field at the big scale. Mm -hmm. So now we have to go after actually the other sources where actually to co CO2 comes out with a much lower concentration, like power plants, for example, and desalination. And CO2 comes, uh, uh, you know, from the exhaust comes with concentration typically around 10 percent, 10, 12 percent. Wow, that's it. Yeah, because mostly it comes as nitrogen. <coughs> we use typically we use mm. air, right, to burn hydrocarbons, mm -hmm. and as a result, actually we can get actually mostly other gases than CO2. Okay. So, so the separation process here, the capture process, is extremely costly right now. Yeah, mm -hmm. relatively speaking, to basically what uh, what price actually you can afford it to to be used in the so oil, oil field. to catch it and actually siphon it off from all these other uh, gases that are that are coming out. Right, exactly. So you need actually to separate the other <coughs> gases because actually um, typically other gases are, are, are not that, uh, you know, efficient for oil extraction. If you inject nitrogen with, uh, with CO2, typically nitrogen is what we call immiscible with oil. So it doesn't mix with oil, unlike CO2, what, where it actually it is miscible with oil. So it can mix with oil, mm -hmm. improve its property like viscosity, it lowers its viscosity and it actually it, it make it more mobile. So it can actually displace oil, push it to the, toward the producer. Mm. On the other hand, nitrogen, it is much lighter gas. Uh, even at the high pressure, at the condition we deal with, it stays as gas, gas, uh, you know, a gas phase. And what it typically, because it has much higher uh, mobility mm -hmm. compared to the oil and the water in the, in the reservoir, it starts to channel through the oil, okay? Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it is uh, it's similar actually when you try to wash, for example, uh, motor oil with water. It's going to go through and make channels, right? Uh, what we call viscous fingering. Mm -hmm. And you end up by just having recycling uh, nitrogen. So it goes to the injector, you inject it, it shoots right away to the producer and get out. So it's right. very, typically it's not efficient, it's not as efficient as CO2. Okay. So this is why actually we need actually to use almost pure CO2, you know, the other gases, they have also other implication to the reservoir. So, so how far away are we from realizing the benefit of, of such a thing, of being able to capture CO2 in some form, transport it, and then use it? Uh, I, I guess you're suggesting that, that 
pumping it underground to help uh, reach some of these other deposits, is that sequestration or is that a separate process? Well, it is, I would say, <coughs> um, uh, partially co uh, 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 sequestration and uh -huh. uh, partially it is recycling. Okay. Because even when you use CO2, right, you inject CO2 at the end, uh, you're going to have at some point, CO2 will start actually to uh, break through, get to the producer and you get produced with the oil. Mm -hmm. But typically what we do here is, uh, it is actually within some contained system. So within the facilities, you know, we don't flare CO2, we don't actually uh, uh, emit it to the atmosphere, we go and recycle it back. To the base, you push it back to the injector. Right, like I think, I think a lot of people have this sort of wildcat oil well uh, scenario in their mind, where you sort of poke a hole and a bunch of stuff shoots out and you grab it. Right, but it's much more controlled than that. Okay. Yeah, because uh, this, uh, you know, uh, basic oil extraction, it goes through different stages. You know, the okay. the, the initial stages. This is when you have a fresh, you know, a reservoir. Right. Basically, you can uh, just uh, dig a hole, and then because of the internal it energy of the reservoir, you can push the oil up, right, mm -hmm. for it. But this can only produce maybe up to 10% of the oil. Ah. At, after that, you know, the, the, the pressure will go down, you know, and deplete in the reservoir, and then you don't have enough energy from the reservoir to push the oil up. Mm -hmm. So this is where actually you start <coughs> to do other, uh, other uh, technology like water flood. You can actually inject... Uh, now uh, basically d uh, drill other wells where you only inject water from some wells and to increase the reservoir pressure and displace or oil mm -hmm. and this is the most common way right now you know worldwide including actually here in saudi arabia most wow. of the oil actually is produced from water flood interesting and the last stage this is mm -hmm. where actually we call enhanced oil recovery because this goes on the top of the water flood mm -hmm. okay and uh, and this where uh, enhance our recovery and which that includes CO2 uh, EUR, it is complement to the uh, water flood. With water flood, you can produce maybe up to 40% of the oil. 60% okay. will stay actually trapped in the reservoir. Mm. CO2 could actually push that maybe to additional 20%, you know, to 60% mm. uh, from the original oil in place. Mm. So this is why it is very, very, uh, very useful in terms of oil extraction. The gap Again, it is cost. Uh, it is related to the, the cost. Uh, you know, till now we don't have the technology. Uh, technology is there, but the uh, to capture CO2, but it is still expensive. So, so this has only been done in an experimental sense, not in an actual uh, rig or anything. Well, uh, in, in in terms of CO2 injection, uh, this is a mature technology. This ah, is not okay. new technology. Okay, this has been implemented, uh, uh, been started in the U.S. since the 70s. Oh, okay. So this is, uh, of course, you know, 30, 35 years ago. You mm -hmm. know, uh, this is a proven technology, and uh, significant actually more than for uh, more than 100 fields in the U.S., for example, and Canada are operated under CO2 injection. Mm -hmm. And uh, even actually here in Saudi Arabia, you know, Aramco has started a pilot uh, three years ago in 2015, where actually there, um, this is actually in uh, a field on the uh, eastern side where actually they extract. They capture CO2 from a gas uh, mm. processing unit, mm -hmm. and they sh uh, transport it to that field, and they inject it there. Interesting. So, okay. uh, also again, you know, on this, there is actually some momentum around it. You know, especially in the region here in Saudi, in the uh, UAE, also they actually implemented the CO2 pilot right now. Mm. Um, so, technology-wise, <laughs> it is proven technology. The key issue here, the key challenge, how you can, how can you make it economical? Right. So uh, that leads me to training the next generation of uh, guys and girls that are going to be doing this and looking into this. Before we go there. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, sorry. I think I, think I want to <laughs> touch upon a very important point uh -huh. that Professor Hotait mentioned, was that the exhaust from a combustor has only 10%, 12% of CO2, yeah. highly dilute. The majority is nitrogen. And again, remember, we burn fuel with air. Air has 79% nitrogen. So all that nitrogen ends up in the exhaust and makes the CO2 highly dilute. And then it makes it very expensive to take that, that CO2 out. Right. So one area we, we really try to work on is how can we burn differently to make that exhaust more concentrated in CO2? And if the more concentrated it is, the cheaper it is to remove Absolutely. and uh, the easier it is to capture and, and to transport. 
So, so, so what's the answer to that so, question? So uh, yeah. there's several <laughs> options. Okay, one op one feasible way of doing this is uh -huh. what we call oxy fuel combustion. Uh -huh. So instead of burning fuel and air, air which has oxygen and nitrogen, all we really want is the oxygen. So we burn fuel and pure oxygen is one possibility uh, inside of the combustor, and then the product is only CO2 and water. And then that's a highly pure form of CO2. There's hardly any separation required mm. from other gases. Uh, you still need a working fluid for the engine. Engine needs a working fluid. It needs an inert gas to, to drive the thermodynamic process. So you recycle some of the CO2 back to the engine. So you're actually burning fuel and oxygen in the presence of CO2 in the engine, and the exhaust is a CO2 and water. Mm. We're working on a, a very novel cycle. Uh, we call it the alum cycle. And this is a very high efficiency stationary power generation uh, device. To give you an idea, a conventional power plant is going to operate about 60% efficiency if it's a gas turbine combined cycle, but the product is a CO2 diluted in air. What we want to do is we want to move to an even higher efficiency cycle above 65% for stationary applications, mm. but producing a pure CO2 as the output. And the way of achieving this is to, to burn fuel, oxygen, and CO2 at a very high pressure, 300 bar, in a constant pressure process in a, in a burner, and then take the product, which is a high temperature CO2, and expand that from 300 bar down to 30 bar in a turbine. To give you an idea, the size of a typical gas turbine producing uh, 50 megawatts is maybe a large, the size of a truck. Yeah. Wow. Uh, or about three quarters the size of a truck. Mm -hmm. This type of uh, CO2, supercritical CO2 turbine that goes from 300 bar down to 30 bar is about the size of this uh, coffee table. So 50 megawatts in the size of this coffee table mm -hmm. to produce the same amount of energy in a co conventional uh, combustor that might be the size of a, of a, of a large truck. Wow. And uh, we're working heavily on this technology, the alum cycle, so we can produce pure CO2. Mm -hmm. And then that CO2 is uh, mm -hmm. food grade. You need food grade. I recall the, the enhanced oil recovery guys say they want food grade CO2. <laughs> Especially when it gets at high pressure, right? Because now you also, uh, you know, you cut the cost on compressing CO2. So uh -huh. this is a... Yeah. So the, well, again, my colleague, Professor Dibble, will say, this is a power plant with no smokestack. Wow. Everything that comes in is exhaust is pure CO2, and it basically goes straight into the ground right. as, as enhanced oil recovery. So, so I think consumers would say, cool, let's do it. Like, wh yeah. how far out is is, is uh, So there's is all, already a pilot plant <coughs> burning a natural gas mm -hmm. in Texas based on the alum cycle. It's by a company called Eight Rivers. And, uh, and this is actually part of a large initiative now uh, wherein there's many countries now contributing to climate change and climate initiative and carbon management. Mm -hmm. And uh, the U.S. and Saudi Arabia are taking the lead on developing uh, uh, basically high-efficiency combustion-generated power technologies, ones that will produce CO2 that's easy to sequester. Right. And U.S. and, and uh, Saudi Arabia have actually selected this type of technology as one of the, uh, as one of the key ways of achieving future CO2 mitigation targets. Wow. So there's a pilot plant operating now on natural gas. What we're going to work on is can we, instead of burning natural gas, can we burn uh, liquid fuels? Mm -hmm. Can we burn heavy fuels? Can we burn other types of uh, feedstocks and make this type of combustor more flexible mm -hmm. so it could be deployed in many different markets around the world? So I think it's a, and I would say the Ministry of in Saudi Arabia is also interested mm -hmm. in this type of technology perhaps purchasing these types of power plants 10, 15 years from now. So we're working on the technology to make those those types of uh, power plants realizable in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you can say it's good for enhanced oil recovery because it's already pr uh, compressed, but it's also good for our guys who want to convert CO2 to chemicals. The reactors that use the catalytic reactors to convert CO2 to methanol, right. to uh, plastics, they typically operate in the range of 20 to 50 atmospheres. Mm -hmm. So being able to deliver them with high pressure CO2 also makes it easier for them to do catalysis and conversion of CO2 to other types of uh, 
uh, petrochemical feedstocks. We, we spoke with Professor Patzik recently, and he was saying um, that moving to, as you said, burning uh, natural gas as opposed to oil was a big uh, thing for the kingdom as well. So it sounds like this would really help uh, sort of drive some of that. Mm -hmm. um, so now I was trying to get into, um, before that, and thank you yeah. for that, um, uh, I was trying to get into some of the educational initiatives. Uh, uh, both of you in, are involved in the centers in, in helping uh, train up the next generation of, of students. I know that you guys did a summer school um, at the CCRC this past year. Talk a little bit, uh, Manny, maybe you can start about what you guys are doing to kick off the next generation of researchers. So what, one thing we realize is, uh, you know, young people today are very mindful about the issues related to climate change, mm. issues related to carbon, and uh, they're really passionate to find out ways in which to solve the problem. Actually, I, I teach a course here in sustainable engineering. This last week we did a, a game or a simulation of world climate negotiations. We actually simulated COP24 in our, in our classroom this week. And we had students role playing as policy makers about how to achieve the climate targets, how to mitigate the impacts of climate change in, in uh, the year 2100, which is the aim of all these uh, large UN conventions. Now these are scientists and engineering students that uh, we try, I tried to get them into a framework of understanding the challenges around mm -hmm. negotiations, around achieving targets from a policy making perspective. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, what they realize is, okay, there's this whole political side, but mm -hmm. in order to achieve any climate target, you need the technology. Okay, it's not enough to just uh, set policies, to make uh, commitments, Technology is a critical aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And many different types of technologies are needed. You need renewables. You need uh, ways of capturing CO2, perhaps from the atmosphere, and from the air, uh, using materials. You need uh, new types of combustion technologies. You need to understand uh, how CO2 can be better utilized in, in various applications, like enhanced oil recovery. Mm -hmm. So for the students interested in, in fields of chemical engineering and mechanical engineering, we teach them very much, like you have interest in thermodynamics. Yeah. You have interest in, in chemical reactions. You can engineer these things in the field of combustion to actually reduce CO2 emissions, to generate technologies will make it easier to deal with uh, the challenges of fossil fuel use for, for power generation, mm -hmm. for automobiles. And, and it, again, we try to provide them with fundamental scientific mm -hmm. knowledge, tools, right. theories, and capabilities so then they can take these and they can develop technologies, right. and they can develop solutions. And that's essentially what I think our objective is in Combustion Center. It's all in the framework of uh, power generation, mobility type solutions. But again, I would say uh, students in all disciplines at KAUST try to do the same thing. They try to develop their fundamental skills with an aim to solve global challenges. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and from the ANPER perspective? <coughs> well, from, from uh, ANPER, uh, although actually our our basic center is mainly about petroleum, but uh, our focus actually is going beyond petroleum now. Mm. And uh, our program, actually, you mentioned about the students and our next generation. Actually, the, our program we call it energy resources and petroleum engineering. Mm. So we keep actually the the petroleum engineering because for us it, this is the core, right? For for especially here in the kingdom, mm -hmm. petroleum actually is a major component in the uh, the economic cycle. So this is their major focus on it. Mm -hmm. But what we're trying to do is we we understand now we realize that <clears throat> energy and environment actually are the key challenge for the next generation, mm -hmm. and this is where actually we start to 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 capitalize actually on our experience from reservoir engineering, from petroleum engineering, and and build on the top of that to go beyond it. So one, one application that we're working on it is the uh, geothermal, basic geothermal energy. And with that, because uh, geothermal also requires actually uh, drilling wells, requires actually injecting fluid and producing fluid. So this is some area that actually we're, uh, we're uh, basically we have experience with. So try actually to to use this experience for something beyond petroleum. So this is this one area. I know you mentioned uh, Professor Pazic also has other interests in, in terms of uh, sensors, in terms of uh, solar energy and so on. We also have within the center uh, 
Professor uh, Santa Marina, who's also doing, um, trying actually to enhance, uh, also working on sensors, exploration, the Red Sea, yeah. uh, subsea, and, and so on. So, uh, and for myself, actually, I'm still focusing on the, what I call the classical petroleum engineering, mm. because we still need actually to understand the fundamentals, right? Even if you go, uh, you know, beyond the, uh, the classical petroleum engineering, but this doesn't mean that actually you, you, you yeah, ignore absolutely. it, right? Or you yeah. don't, uh, don't basically uh, <coughs> capture the fundamentals. So we still, in my case, you know, uh, my focus area is in has oil recovery, is in water flood and so on. This is what we call, still call it actually cl uh, classical petroleum engineering. Others in the group uh, or in the center actually uh, work on other areas that at the end, actually, we try to complement yeah. okay, the whole story and and build actually an integrating uh, integrated effort between yeah. all the uh, the faculty and the researcher actually even outside our center to right. to to address that challenge again, environment and energy, which is mm -hmm. aligned with cost uh, focus area as well. Yeah. Now. now uh CCRC might have the world's coolest uh, internship or uh, sort of agreement that, that puts students in a, in a, a neat uh, place. And it relates to efficiency. Uh, talk a little bit about the McLaren uh, partnership that, that was started uh, earlier this year. Yeah, so again, in combustion, what we're con in interested in is to sh demonstrate that combustion does not have to be a dirty technology, does right. not have, have to be an inefficient technology. There are solutions, and uh, those solutions can make their way into consumer applications provided there's enough uh, motivation and provided the market is right. So uh, an excellent demonstration of uh, automotive applications that started a research perspective that eventually makes their way into commercial sectors is Formula One. Yeah. Formula One racing is a, is a very expensive sport to be involved in. It's the pinnacle on automotive sport as the, as the, the the Formula One uh, International Agency says. Mm -hmm. And uh, many technologies like seat belts, airbags, anti-lock brakes, uh, uh, automatic gearboxes, they were developed in Formula One. Mm -hmm. And they've actually made their way to make a passenger vehicle safer, uh, road tires technology uh, more e efficient and effective, mm -hmm. gearbox transmissions more effective. So an interesting thing with uh, Formula One is in the past, uh, 12 years, they've put regulations to push the Formula One uh, automakers and the teams to reduce their fuel consumption. So they've been pushed to produce higher efficiency engines mm. and also to develop fuel technologies together with oil companies uh, that are able to, to power the vehicle, provide more power using less amount of fuel. Mm. So when uh, McLaren racing which is uh, the Formula One company within the overall McLaren technology group first heard about KAUST and came to KAUST, they saw we had many capabilities in developing high combustion efficiency technologies mm -hmm. and also engineering fuel formulations to make engines uh, more effective. So that's how we started this partnership with them uh, to develop advanced uh, fuel engine technologies for higher efficiency engines. Right now, the Formula One engines are about 50 to 52 percent efficient, much more efficient than uh, the auto uh, conventional automobile you'll find on a road, about 10 to 15 time percent uh, more efficient. Mm -hmm. And they're using a specific type of combustion technology called a pre-chamber combustion. And the fuels they use uh, are also tailored to that type of uh, combustion technology. And going forward, as, as FIA Formula One uh, regulations change, they're going to get more strict about even using less fuel, uh, getting more hybrid power, so combining batteries together with uh, the conventional internal combustion engine, and that's going to make the, these vehicles even more efficient. Mm. So we, we joined forces with uh, McLaren Racing to try to, on one hand, develop this technology. Using our fundamental science, they realized, uh, even from their end, they need uh, to know the fundamental science. They need to know from a technology perspective, how can I engineer combustion reactions? How can I engineer the thermodynamic process of mixing mm -hmm. and combustion inside the chamber to produce a better engine, which will make their car go faster? 
That's right. their goal in the end. Right. Get to the finish line first. Right. And, uh, but for and a then student, it, it's made a, and a great for, you know, for, right. for young people mm -hmm. to, to really show, to, as an engineer, as a scientist, you're always passionate to see your technology implemented somewhere. Mm -hmm. And it's a long way to get a technology implemented in the commercial sector. We might do something in the lab, maybe by the end of your career as a professor, 30, 40 years later, you might see your technology become realized. But uh, in something like Formula One, the development time scales are extremely fast. fast. So if we develop something, they move right away to implement it in the vehicle. And then, of course, it's on a, a global stage, so it's right. exciting. Uh, you can see your technologies, your work done in the field of combustion. There's projects related to aerodynamics to make vehicles more aerodynamically efficient as well. Mm. You can see how maybe one year, two years of research can immediately uh, help a Formula One team on the racetrack uh, improve their performance. That's, that's very exciting, very exciting. Well, thank you both, and uh, best of luck to you in, in Poland. Thanks for thanks for coming by. Okay, yeah. you're welcome. Thank, thank you. Thank for you. Having. Thanks for having us. And that's all the time we have for today. Remember to comment, like, and share on all the Kaust social channels. And from everyone here at Kaust, thanks for watching.